please, in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Have I told you lately how pleased I am to be your pastor? Thank you for answering and not leaving me hanging out there. Appreciate that. Oh, shucks. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, you know what's on my heart and mind at this point? Vacation Bible School. That's the task that God has set before us, and I would ask each and every one of you that you begin to focus your hearts and minds right now towards Vacation Bible School and the job that God has prepared for each and every one of us. Let's please be in prayer. This is our uh, theme for this year, is intercessory prayer. And so let's be very much in prayer for each and every child that will be there, for each and every teacher, for everyone who plays any part whatsoever in Vacation Bible School, that this will be the best year yet. Amen? Amen. We're in Acts chapter 20 today. 
uh, I want to tell you before I read this story that I did some fact checking, and the basic facts of this story uh, are true. There may be a little bit of embellishment. I always, I think embellishment is good, really, for any good story. Uh, but I think you'll enjoy it. It's actually two stories into one. But again, uh, it's based on factual events. Many years ago, Al Capone, you ever heard of Al Capone? <laughs> Many years ago, Al Capone virtually owned Chicago. Capone wasn't famous for anything heroic. He was notorious for uh, enmeshing the windy city of Chicago in everything from bootlegged booze and prostitution to murder. Al Capone had a lawyer nicknamed Easy Eddie. And he was his lawyer for a very good reason. Uh, Eddie was very good. In fact, Eddie's skill at legal maneuvering kept Big Al out of jail for a long time. And to show his appreciation, Al Capone paid him very, very well. Not only was the money big, but also Eddie got special dividends. Uh, for instance, he and his family occupied a fenced-in mansion with live-in help and all the conveniences of the day. Uh, his estate was so large that it filled an entire Chicago city block. He lived the high life of the Chicago mob and gave very little consideration to the atrocity that went on around him. Eddie did have one soft spot, though, and that was his son. Uh, he loved him very dearly. Eddie saw to it that his young son had clothes, cars, a good education. He withheld nothing from him. Price was no object. And despite his involvement with organized crime, Eddie even tried to teach him right from wrong because he wanted his son to be a better man than he was. Yet, with all his wealth and influence, there were two things that he could not give his son. He couldn't pass on a good name to him, and he couldn't provide a good example for his son as he was growing up. One day, Easy Eddie had a change of heart, and he decided, based on the love of his son, that he wanted to provide a better example and to somehow right some of the wrongs that he had done. So he decided to go to the authorities and tell the truth about Al Capone. He wanted to try and clean up his tarnished name and to offer his son some semblance of integrity. To do this, he would have to testify against the mob, and he knew that the cost would be great. And so he testified. And as a result of his testimony, uh, Al Capone went to jail, uh, went to prison uh, involving tax evasion. Uh, but within the year, Easy Eddie's life ended in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago street. But at least in his eyes, he had given his son the greatest gift that he could offer him at that point, and he paid with his life. Now, the next story. World War II produced many heroes. One such man was Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. He was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington in the South Pacific. One day, his entire squadron was sent on a mission, and after he was airborne, he looked at his fuel gauge and realized that in the hurry, someone had forgotten to top off his fuel tank. He would not have enough fuel to complete his mission and to get back to his ship. His flight leader told him to return to the carrier, and so reluctantly, Butch O'Hare dropped out of the formation and headed back to the fleet. And as he was returning to the carrier, he saw something that turned his blood cold. A squadron of Japanese aircraft were speeding their way toward the American fleet. The American fighters were on a sortie, and the fleet was all but defenseless. He couldn't just reach his squadron and, and, and bring them word back in time to warn them of the coming danger, so there was only one thing that he could do. He somehow must divert them away from the fleet. And so laying aside all thoughts of personal safety, he dove into the formation of Japanese planes he had a wing-mounted 50 caliber gun on his fighter, and he blazed it away, charging in and attacking. And his, as he came in, he was weaving in and out, attacking one surprise plane after another. Uh, he broke up their formation and fired at as many planes as possible until his ammunition was spent. But even then, he continued the assault. He dove at the planes, trying to clip a wing or a tail in hopes of damaging as many enemy planes as possible and causing them to be unfit to fly. Finally, the exasperated Japanese squadron took off in another direction, and deeply relieved, Butch O'Hare and his tattered fighter limped back to the carrier. Upon arrival, he reported in and related the events surrounding the return. Some were a bit skeptical until they saw the uh, gun-mounted camera uh, that was on his plane, and it showed everything. Uh, he had, in fact, destroyed at least five enemy aircraft. 
This took place on February the 20th, 1942, and for that action, Butch O'Hare became the Navy's first ace of World War II and the first naval aviator to ever win the Congressional Medal of Honor. A year later, Butch was killed in aerial combat at the age of 29. Now, what do these two stories have in common? Well, Butch O'Hare was Easy Eddie's son. And so, while he didn't see greatness necessarily in his father, he did go on to become a man who was great by our standards. Having said that, I want to reintroduce you to someone who was great by God's standards, and that is the Apostle Paul. We're in Acts chapter 20, and as we begin the message today, my question for you is this. What made Paul a great Christian? What made Paul a great Christian? We're in Acts chapter 20. Let's take a look at verse 17. Acts 20, 17 says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders or the pastors of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know that from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound or tied in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a great morning that you've provided us to live and to breathe upon your good earth. Father, thank you so much for the presence of the Holy Spirit that we have felt uh, even up until right now. Father, we thank you for war heroes. Uh, Lord, we were given the opportunity last week to pay tribute uh, towards those who were fallen, those who were missing, those who were taken prisoner. And fathers, we take a look at someone who was about to end up as a prisoner, the Apostle Paul. Lord, I pray that you would fill our hearts with convictions that are stronger than life and death. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in a powerful way this morning. And Father, when everything is said and done, as we ask ourselves the question and ask you the question of your word today, what made Paul a great Christian? Lord, I pray that you would help us to find the answers to that question. And not only to assimilate facts, our Father, but I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, you would inspire us to draw closer to a great Savior who is able to make us great in your eyes because of the merits of our Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. What made Paul a great Christian? Well, first of all, Paul was a great Christian because nothing moved him. His mind was made up. And as I thought about this, I thought about, I thought beyond the Apostle Paul, and I began thinking about the Lord Jesus Paul said that he was bound, he was tied in the spirit as he was going to Jerusalem. You see, he had a great love for his people, the Jews, and his desire to set them free from the slavery and the bondage of sin that held him is what compelled him to go to Jerusalem, even though he knew everywhere he went, the Holy Spirit was testifying to him through God's people that persecution was awaiting him. Nevertheless... He went. He was determined to go. This reminded me of our Lord Jesus, whom the Bible says that he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem, even though he knew that death awaited him there. Peter begged him not to go. But Jesus was determined to go. He was compelled to go. Why? Because of his great love for mankind, for the Jews, not only for the Jews, for you as well. 
And so the great love of God is what compelled our Lord Jesus to set his face like a flint because of his love for you, because of his love for me. And so he went as well. But coming back to the Apostle Paul, nothing moved him because trials had made him strong. Paul had faced persecution. He had faced stoning, ridicule, imprisonment, shipwreck. He had been stoned to death. And through all the different persecutions and all the trials that he faced, he had the right heart attitude in the midst of whatever circumstance he happened to find himself in. And because he bore up underneath those trials, those trials made him strong. Those trials made him unmovable in the work of the Lord. His foundation was also strong. Why? Because his foundation was Christ. No other foundation can any man lay except that which has been laid, even Jesus Christ. The rains fell, the winds blew, but you know what? The, even though the waves came crashing in, his house stood because it was built on the solid rock foundation of Jesus Christ, who was the rock of the ages. And as we think about the fact that Paul was a great Christian because nothing moved him, my question to you this morning is, how movable are you? How movable am I? What does it take to move you? Does it take negative circumstances? Because we all know that circumstances change all the time, don't they? Some days it just seems spiritually that we can be on top of the world. The next day we can find ourselves fighting depression as Christians. What does it take to move you? Negative cir circumstances? Uh, do problems at home move you? Maybe things aren't going that great between you and your spouse. Maybe things aren't going that great with your kids. For our young people, peer pressure, does that move you? What does it take to move you away from Jesus? You know what God would have Pastor Steve to do and to be? You know what God would have each and every one of you? You know where he would have you be in life? He would have you to be unmovable. He would have you and I to be consistent in our walk with him. And as we think about consistency, I want to admonish everyone here in this early service, as I will in the second service, don't wait until Sunday morning to decide if you're going to come to church. Don't wait until Wednesday afternoon to decide if you're going to go to prayer meeting. Don't wait until Sunday afternoon to find out if you are going to be investing in your own spiritual life and coming to Bible study. Don't wait, but decide, okay, that unless you are providentially hindered, then you're going to be in the house of God at every opportunity you get, okay, for the sake of your own soul. Be consistent in your church attendance. Be consistent in your walk with the Lord. And whenever you come to Mount Lebanon, Determine that you're not just going to be a spectator. For God's sake, find something to do. Okay? If you want something to do, go see Brother Ronnie. You've got a list out there, don't you? And if you have trouble figuring out what it is that God wants you to do, then come and see me, and I'll help you. Okay? So we'll put you to work. But understand something. If you're not plugged in, to the ministry of Mount Lebanon Baptist Church. Understand this. It doesn't just affect you. It affects all of us. You know why? Because we are one. Because we are joined. And we need each and every one pulling their load. Amen? As your pastor, I would see you walk consistently as a Christian. And not only your love for the Lord Jesus, but also in your service to him. You know what the secret is to being consistent? I'll be honest with you. It's not hard. This is the secret. To understand what the psalmist understood. Listen to the words of David. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Watch this. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Meditate on this. 
The secret of, consistently, of, consi- of consistency is abiding, learning to abide in Christ, learning to take your place under the shadow of, of his wings. If you do that, I guarantee you that you will not have a problem walking consistently before Jesus. And if you find yourself taking shelter in him on a consistent basis, you will find yourself unmovable. as a Christian, and in your walk with your Father. Paul wanted God's glory. He wanted God's glory and not his own. You see, there's something that you need to understand about Paul. His life was not precious in his eyes. That's another thing that made him a great Christian. His life was not precious in his own eyes. Did you know that Paul was ready to die for the Lord Jesus? Do you know why he was ready to die for the Lord Jesus? Because he lived for the Lord Jesus. And and if if the truth were told, the Apostle Paul spiritually had been dying for a long time. Okay? You don't just wake up one morning and say, you know what, in all honesty, I'm ready to die for Jesus. That doesn't just happen. It happens after a long time of daily dying. It happens after a long time of consistent living for the Lord Jesus. He was ready to die for him. Listen to what he says, Acts 21, 13. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of our Lord Jesus. You see, he counted his own life to be worthless. Philippians 3, 7. But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss, all things loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them rubbish that I may gain Christ. You see, in this wording, you find the picture of an accountant. And Paul counted the cost of discipleship. And as he counted the cost, like an accountant, you know what it added up to? It, it, it added up to a pile of waste. Up to a pile of human excrement. He says, he's very descriptive and even graphic in his language here. As we said, he's been dying for a long time. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Again, he wanted God's glory, not his own. He said, but God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross, an instrument of death. That's what he chose to glory in except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom, as a result of the cross, the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Paul was a great Christian because he learned what it meant to be crucified. Paul wanted to be spiritually strong. He wanted God's strength and not his because he understood that God's strength, the strength of Jesus, is made perfect in weakness. And so I ask you the question today, what is more precious to you, this earthly life or the unseen life that awaits you in the world to come? When it comes right down to it, What is more precious? Understand something. That question that I just asked you, what is more precious to you, this worldly life or the unseen life of the child of God? The answer to that question in your life is what is going to shape your daily life. It is what will shape your choices. It is what will shape your priorities. It's what will shape your dreams of the future. It's a very important question, Brother Ronnie. What made Paul a great Christian? Number three, Paul understood where true power came from. Listen to the word of God. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. 
and my speech and my preaching... Well, understand this. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power. Why? So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know what he's saying here? What he's saying flies in the face of what I see with a lot of preachers. Because a lot of preachers will rely on uh, their charismatic personalities. They'll rely on good looks or their sense of humor or their popularity or, or all the, their talents, their intelligence. They rely on all these things. And it goes beyond preachers because Christians, regular, ordinary Christians, rely on those things as well every day. But that is not what the Apostle Paul relied on. And because he didn't rely on those things... That's what made him a great Christian because he understood a great spiritual secret, the great spiritual secret that Hudson Taylor understood that God would have each and every one of you to understand this morning. And it is this, apart from the power, the genuine power of the Holy Spirit, nothing else matters because nothing will be accomplished of any lasting value apart from that. So in the end, it doesn't matter how well someone sings. In the end, it doesn't matter uh, what resources a church has. What matters is, is the power of the Holy Spirit there. And you know what we need to beg God for every day as a church? And what you need to beg for, and I need to beg for every day as Christ followers, we need to beg for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, for His power to be present and obvious that it is at work. And if you are here this morning and you cannot honestly say that you have been anointed and empowered by the Holy Spirit for Christian living, then you know what you need to do? You need to come down to this altar and beg God to give it to you. And if you don't see the anointing power of the Holy Spirit upon our church, then you need to come down to this altar and beg God to give it to the collective whole. Can I get a witness? That is the power that Paul understood. And that is the power that he experienced in daily Christian living. And it's what made him a great Christian. He had no confidence in himself. But you know what he had? He had peace about what God was doing in his life at any given time. He did not rely on human ability. Rather, he wanted it to be clear that it was a God thing. And he wanted the Corinthian faith to be of God and not of Paul. And not of Paul. I, I love this quote when I came across it from an unknown preacher. Here's what he said. He said, the preacher is there as the representative of God, as though God did beseech you by us. He is there to present the gospel of God, not human ideals, if it is only because of my preaching that people desire to be better, they will never get anywhere near Jesus Christ. Anything that flatters me in my preaching of the gospel will end in making me a traitor to Jesus. I prevent the creative power of his redemption from doing its work. I love that quote because it's so true. Paul understood that if it's not born of the Holy Spirit, it is nothing. Personality charisma, intelligence, talent, all these things may get you ahead in the world. But I guess what it comes right down to is, what is your measure of success? A worldly applause or a well done, thou good and faithful servant? Can the Holy Spirit use those things? Yes, if they're dedicated to him. But again, it comes down to the power of God. Number four, as we quickly move. The thing that made Paul a great Christian was the fact that he was transparent. Listen to what he said. Basically, the, the summation of what I'm about to read is this. Paul said, you know what? I ain't perfect. Listen, not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. Why? So that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also has laid hold of me. Brethren, I don't count myself to have arrived spiritually, to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal. The goal of what? 
the goal of sanctification, the goal of Christ's likeness for the prize of the upward call of God, which is in Christ Jesus. He made no pretenses about himself. I love that. He was a real man with real struggles, and he didn't hide behind a church face. Can I tell you something? That is how people really bond within a church, whenever they're transparent, whenever they can learn to be real. You know what? As Christians, and I understand this, I I really do. As Christians, we want people to think the best of us, don't we? Yeah, we do. And so we hesitate sometimes to open up. We hesitate to admit when we're hurting or having a struggle. Or or we hesitate to admit when we're trying to figure something out. Do you think there's anything wrong spiritually with trying to figure something out? No, nothing wrong with that at all. But sometimes we just don't want to readily admit that. That we don't have all the answers. And I want to tell you something. Men especially can benefit from knowing that the struggles that they face are not unique to them. Wives, I want, I, want to, I want you to understand something. We as men, we, we, have, we have struggles, okay? Just like you have struggles. We have things that we're trying to deal with. Sometimes we find it difficult to face the pressures of life because men especially feel the pressure. They feel the pressure to provide for their families. They feel the pressure to lead their families spiritually. That is a weight in and of itself. And whenever men realize that they don't have to go it alone, but there's others that are feeling those same pressures and face those same temptations, that helps a man to be able to understand that and to realize that. And that's what really causes bonding in a church. You see, men, there's this result from the fall. And the result that comes from the fall is that men are afraid if we're honest, we're afraid of failure. And that fear of failure drives us, okay? And sometimes it helps because I, I want to be, I'm talking about transparency, so I want to be transparent with you. There are times as a Christian that I, I fight depression, all right? And it's at those times that my wife really shows her quality. I faced one of those times recently uh, and you know what my wife will do? She'll just love on me. And she'll tell me, you know what, it's going to be okay. Okay, I believe in you. I believe in your ministry. Jesus believes in you. Keep pressing on. Wives, that, that helps us as husbands to know that you're behind us. But more importantly, for us to have the confidence spiritually that Jesus is for us. If we're living lives that are surrendered to him. My point is this, we need to be transparent. We need to drop the church face. And we need to be willing to talk about different things that we could be struggling with. But, understand this, that while the Apostle Paul had struggles, he didn't focus all of his attention on those struggles forever. Because that will ultimately lead to pride. Okay? Even though Paul had a past, and the Apostle Paul had a past, did he not? The man was a murderer. But you know what? He had been cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been made a new creation. And although he had a past, he chose not to live in the past. But he kept his eyes fixed upon the future. Why? Because he didn't want to be consumed with lesser things. But he kept his eyes on the prize. The upward call of God in Christ Jesus Number five, the thing that made Paul a great Christian was that he wanted to finish well. Again, we come back to verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Life is a race. Yes, it is. And sometimes do we stumble in the race? Yes, we do. But Jesus doesn't focus in on just the stumbles. And sometimes whenever we find ourselves to have stumbled spiritually, we feel like, oh my goodness, my life is ruined. I have lost my testimony. You know what? I'm of no further use to God. And a thousand different thoughts will go through our minds. But understand something. 
When you're running the race, though you may stumble and though you may fall, you do not have to live there because Jesus does not just judge you and evaluate you based upon your stumbles. He takes a look at the race overall. And he sees the work. See, understand something. Jesus is for you. And because he is for you, he says, you know what, I know that you fell, but by the grace, by my grace, get up and start again. Press on. That's what he says. And whenever you and I figure that out, and we understand that we serve a God of love, a God who gives us his unmerited favor, and whenever we eat, sleep, live, and breathe by his grace, then we walk with him. And we keep our eyes fixed upon him. And he gives us the victory. And whenever we look back on our lives, and he helps us to evaluate where we've come from and where he has brought us, then we begin to realize that he is doing something beautiful in each and every one of us. Why? Because we are his workmanship created by Christ Jesus unto good works that he's prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. You understand? Paul wanted to finish the race with joy. Isn't that awesome? With joy. What kind of joy? The joy of being counted worthy to suffer. The joy of being right with God. The joy of knowing that a well done was awaiting him. And the word received has in it the idea of a steward. You see, the steward of a household received responsibility given to him by the master. What has God made you a steward of at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church? Understand, the job that Jesus has given you in the local church, and by the way, I'm a great fan of, of parachurch organizations. I'm a great fan of pregnancy care centers. I'm a big fan of food shelters. Why? Because we partner with those organizations because we can't do everything as a local church. But understand something. You can have the greatest parachurch organizations in the world, but in the end, it comes down to the local church because the local church is what Jesus promised that he would use. And so you can go out and you can uh, work as a volunteer in all these different areas, and I'm not minimizing that because the Lord Jesus loves that. But understand something. The question is, what are you engaged in at the local church level? Okay? Because that's what he promised he would use. It's kind of like a tithe, okay? And I'm not going to get into tithing, okay? Don't get freaked out. <laughs> but you know that a tithe is the base, and anything that you give above and beyond that is an offering. And, and just as that is the case, so what we do in the local church is kind of like the tithe. That's our base. And what we do beyond that is like the offering. You understand? Good. I'm going to stop there. What is the job that Jesus has given you? Whatever that job is, do not take it lightly. Understand something. Don't do your ministry here half-hearted. But whatever God has given you, do it with joy and do it to the fullest, okay? It's not enough just to get something done. But do it well. Do it better than you do your worldly job. Do it with honor. Whatever it is that God has given you here to do, do it with enthusiasm, do your Christian service to the best of your ability. Give it your all. Can I also admonish you in an area? Don't have to be asked repeatedly to do something that you've committed to, but do it the first time and do it well. I'm not trying to call attention to anybody because everyone, everyone here that serves, uh, I, I love each and every one of you, okay? But I'm going to pick on Brother Jerry for just a second, okay? You know what his hard attitude is in Christian service? He wants to do it right and he wants to do it right the first time. And he doesn't have to have anyone ask him to do the job that God has given him. He does it with all of his heart. Okay? Okay, we're not having a praise service for him. I'm just pointing out a reality that I see as a pastor. And I could say that about many of you. Knowing that you want the satisfaction of your master, let that be your motivator, let that be your reward. Let your Christian work be your life's calling. That worldly job that you do, let that simply be the way that you pay your bills. Whatever, whatever ministry God has given you, let that be your life's calling. Okay? You know what Paul's job was? His job was to be a witness, to be an apostle, to be a testimony. Making tents, that's how he paid his bills. 
His life's calling was being a servant for Jesus Christ. A steward owns nothing but possesses everything. Now, to testify has in it the idea of being a witness. And we can only witness to what we've seen and heard, amen, for ourselves. I want to ask you a question. Will you do what it takes to finish well? We're asking the question this morning, why was Paul a great Christian? Let this be your takeaway. Paul was a great Christian because he gave himself completely over to a great God who took him and made him to become like Jesus. And he will do the same thing for you and I if we will let him. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, as Wendy just quietly plays this morning, Lord, I think about greatness. And Father, I believe that everyone in here today would be very ready to admit that we are what we are by the grace of God and that it's nothing in and of ourselves that achieves greatness. But it is giving ourselves over to a great God and allowing you to have your good pleasure accomplished in each and every one of us. And so, Father, I pray that you will help your people to be able to meditate on these things, to be able to meditate on what made Paul a great Christian. And as Paul com spoke to some and said, follow me as I follow Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. I pray that you would help each and every one of us to take our calling seriously, to realize that time is very short. And, Father, to do the work that you've given us with joy, in great anticipation. Lord, help us to experience daily dying. And I pray that you would help us to live out and experience as reality each and every day your resurrection power. So, Father, we do give ourselves to you as individuals and as the body of Christ. And I pray that as you move in our midst and you lead us on to bigger and greater things in the days ahead, I pray that you would fill us with the joy of your salvation I pray that you would fill us with a great sense of enthusiasm and great expectation so that we can see you accomplish God-sized things that cannot be explained in any human way. Father, we love you. We don't say that lightly. And we commit ourselves to you. And Father, if there is anything in any individual life this morning that is hindering them from being able to say, you know what, I am living a crucified life, and I, I am experiencing the joy of the salvation of Jesus. Lord, if there's anything in the way, Lord, I pray that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, like a great wrecking ball, remove those obstacles and cause your people to give themselves over fully and wholly. Set us free from any bondage that is holding us back and help us to experience as individuals and as the collective whole freedom, joy, and power. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.